thinking clearly are, sh should admit we never are in control. We never know what a day will bring, an hour will bring. So the wise course of action then is to live uh, each day, uh, and each day has enough trouble of its own. I was telling my daughter this. She's uh, been going through some stressful times uh, and so forth because of her work, and uh, you know she has this uh, terrible boss who pushes her too hard. It's me. Uh, but uh, basically, um, she's also uh, due with her second child in, no in November, which I'm excited about. But uh, I told her, you know, Every day has enough trouble of its own, and, and, and maybe you should look at it this way. Every hour has enough trouble of its own. Let's just look at each hour and live from hour to hour. And I think that's not a bad way to go. I sometimes seek to do that. I, as, I've told you this numerous times before, but you need to hear it again and again, at least I do, that um, I find that one day cannot bear the freight of a week. You cannot put the burden of a week or all that you need to do in the next rest of this week on this day. It was never intended to carry that weight. Each day is such that it can provide opportunities and each day is given to you. Living is so daily. You can't live two days at once, just one. Each day is a mini life. You have your birth, you have your growth, you have your decay, and then your death, sleep. Uh, you go and then you go into this death-like state in your sleeping chamber and wake up and you're resurrected in the morning again for another day and so that's uh, not an accidental image each day then is enough but another way of looking at it is every hour has enough for itself so that I can't put this whole day the freight of this day what I have to do today on this one hour I have to live this hour with fidelity being alive to the present moment not waiting until later on, but rather living this hour as I need to. The other thing will find its own time and its own place. And looking at that then gives me a point of view. Well, that's the way I think we should be uh, pursuing the course of our life so that we can realize that whatever God brings into our life is manageable. It is a burden we can sustain because he gives us the grace to do so. 1 Corinthians 10.13 makes that very clear. But I do think we need times of privacy and times of stillness without which we will live on the surface of life. Therefore, it's needful for us to really enrich our lives in times of privacy and stillness. Solitude and silence are absolutely necessary for us to live with any measure of depth in this uh, very, very shallow and um, uh, veneer-like world. We need to be people who live below the surface. Our roots are more uh, firmly planted in the soil of God's word so that we're not going to be uprooted by the winds and storms of today, but rather our roots being firmly planted, the taproot deeply embedded, is able to sustain us so, so that though the outward circumstances may change in, in unexpected ways, nevertheless we have something that's solid that will not really be overthrown. And therefore, when we do this, when we, when we are praying, when we are committing our lives to Christ, when we are meditating on biblical truth, which in the past we've talked about before, I cannot ex uh, express uh, the need for that too greatly, to meditate, to be chewing on truth. When we do that, what we're really doing then is giving ourselves the opportunity to think more deeply and to be people who then are more proactive than merely reactive, who come to life out of, a, out, of a, out of the center, who live out of the center, and that deep, uh, quiet center where Christ is, is where we are to live out of, so that he becomes the hub, the uh, orienting uh, power of our lives. And if we do not then engage in those fundamental disciplines of meditation, of solitude, of silence, of prayer, at least to some degree, we will not really be able to sustain uh, the storms of life when they occur. So that the wise person then uh, looks for the sense of, of Sabbath, uh, as, as uh, Shabbat. And I have said before that there is no shalom without Shabbat. Shalom is the word for peace. It is a word that speaks about an inward uh, sense of harmony or wholeness or a peace, whereby you are not defined by the outward world, but rather you bring this to the outward world. You carry your peace to that world. Jesus, in the midst of opposition, of adversity, of conflict, 
moved in this world clearly with poise and with peace. You never see him anxious. You never see him worried. You never see him in a hurry. But you see him, in spite of all the external turmoil, which only increased as his life went on, we see this very clearly in the Gospels, he lived out of the center. And it was his father who defined him. And so he lived in such a way that the outward circumstances didn't define his mission, but rather it was his father. And where did that get cultivated? In his times, those lonely places that he would go. As it tells us in Luke 5, it was his custom to go from time to time to lonely places, to uh, desert places, as it were, to, to those places where he only hears the voice of God. And unless we create space and time for doing that, to sanctify some space, sanctify some time, then we will not really have that depth when we need it. And so it's these things then that give us uh, the depth and perspective that enable us and empower us to do what God has actually called us and invited us to do and also, of course, to be. Now, I fear that in my own life, much of my energy and strength has been based on talent, effort, pushing and striving. If I'm not if careful, I, it's easy for me to see that over the years I have perhaps depended too much on those kinds of things. Um, it's much better to think not so much what I can do for Jesus, though, but rather what he can do in me. So that instead of focusing on just the doing dimension, I need to focus also on the being dimension. So that what I uh, do flows out of that inner center of being. And I think that's very critical. Any comments on this before we go any further? It's just a little... Lewis. Uh, Lewis, yes. Seems like a... I want to stand up so everyone can hear you. Is that what you're going to do? Sorry. That's our new rule. Just so everyone... Because the acoustics here are not the same as in the other room. <laughs> <There's> a, <laughs> Mr. Bridges. <laughs> it seems like in our culture there's an artificiality of this hurry, hurry. I mean, you always talk about, you know, grace turning to entitlement. You know, luxuries turn to necessities mm -hmm. so fast. I mean, nobody makes us work this hard. Everybody now has cell phones, laptops. I mean, things that were extraordinary devices, you know, giant TVs, you know, entertainment centers. and. It seems like this is a self-imposed problem. It's not really... There's time in the day to spend with God. We just aren't giving it to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, th I think the more toys we have, the more little devices that we possess, the more they possess us if we're not very careful. They're good, they're good servants but poor masters and I fear often become masters that they control people. The first thing people do more and more, I was reading an article about this, Break, they get right out of bed and immediately hit go grab the laptop. And in my view, that's a mistake. I think my temptation is to go right to my computer, check my email, see what the things are going on in the world. That's a mistake for me to make. The better thing for me to do is to seek to begin the day, the first thoughts of the day, are his thoughts. In other words, so his word, the first word. If I can do that. Uh, but I fear that the more of these time-saving devices we possess, as what we know of the irony there is that the more it consumes our time and becomes uh, something that you constantly have to serve and, you, and these are utilities that actually then somehow dominate us. Expectations change. People expect immediate responses and so forth. The, the rules have changed substantially. I think, however, having said that, there's still people always struggle with this idea of living out of the center. It's just that we now have more of a challenge in some respects to do that, more things that can consume us. And also, a big challenge for the depth of relationships. I think that that's a big challenge as well. Uh, anytime I go, for example, to a conference or a seminar or something like that, what I noticed during the break is that in the past, when people would speak to one another during the break, now they do not. They all go off and walk in, they walk in circles uh, in their, on their cell phones, you see. And there's no two people talking to each other in the room there. They're all th moving around during the... So there's really no cultivation of an immediacy or their text messaging or whatever they're doing or their text messaging during the, uh, the meeting, and so, as some of you might be doing right now. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, Joe? Well, it seems to me like a product of our culture. You can see, any, you can see any place in the world with their iPhones people just walking around like this, they walk right by you. You can see them, I saw probably 15 or 20 yesterday, 
you know, you go in almost any place, they're sitting there with their finger punching in. They're not 